It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hello, friends. Today I'm chatting with Dr. Raymond Cloyd of Kansas State University. Now, Dr. Cloyd is a professor and an extension specialist in entomology and plant protection. He is the co-author of the Compendium of Rose Diseases and Pest. His book is the gold standard concerning identification of pests and diseases affecting our roses. And the big topic for today is Japanese beetles. So grab your pencil and paper. It's time for class. Hey, Dr. Cloyd, welcome to Rose Chat. Thank you, Teresa. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, they're called Japanese beetles, but are they really from Japan? Yes, they, they are native of Japan, yes. So what are they, and how do we get them? Well, they are beetles. They're in a group we call scarabeids. Uh, that's just an entomological fancy term, but... Uh, they got. They came to the United States about 1916. They were established in Riverton, New Jersey. Uh, probably uh, like today, the movement of infected plant material or sod, uh, basically from an, from another country. In this case, uh, Japan. So, do in Japan do they have a natural predator, or are they a big problem there too? Well, usually in the native country, there are uh, native natural enemies. Uh, that will uh, basically manage populations below damaging levels. And so that's probably what's happening over there. But when it's introduced to another country, uh, we don't usually, in this case, the USA, we don't have those natural enemies. And so either we go to another country to obtain them, which we call classical biological control, and then we go through the regulatory process, uh, which can be a very, very, very long period of time, years, um, or we wait for our cosmopolitan native species to to uh, provide management, which could be also a long time. Yeah. So other than Japan, they're just in the U.S. or not in other countries? No, they're in other countries also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think they – I spent some time in England. I don't think they have them over there. So luckily, maybe they won't get them. <laughs> So now we know what they are, and we know what they like. They love roses. Is it just roses that they love? No, no. The Japanese beetle adults, and uh, the, the, the adults are the above-ground life stage. The larva, or we call the grub, is the below-ground life stage, feed, feed on roots, primarily turf grass. That's why it's a turf grass pest. But the Japanese beetle adult can feed on over 300 plant species, uh, mostly in plants in the rosaceae family, which is rose, plum, uh, cherry, um, also Virginia creeper. There's a wide diversity. So they're, they're not specific for roses, uh, but they feed on a wide diversity of plants in other plant families. Hmm. One year I planted pole beans and they devoured it. I think they might have liked the pole beans that year better than they liked the roses. It could be I mean, one of our one of the uh, plants that we typically see severely damages uh, linden, uh, Tilia cordata, small leaf linden, and they can just basically very short period of time, depending on the numbers, basically defoliate a linden tree in a very short period of time. So uh, willow is another another host that's out there. So it isn't restricted to roses, uh, but roses give off these volatile compounds that tend to be very attractive. Uh, to Japanese beetles and roses are, are pretty much uh, planted in clumps and gardens and that just manifests itself in terms of the easy, easy making it easy for them to find <laughs> just a smorgasbord laid at their feet <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're, they're not picky about anything they'll they'll eat anything and only because they're out for about three months of the year in general as adults and most of their life cycle is um, below ground either in soil or uh, turf grass mm-hmm 
Mm-hmm. Okay, now let's talk about some of the ways that people try to control them and tell us if it works or it doesn't work. Well, the the this is very unfortunate. And when I gave the talk at the Rose uh, Fest 2000 uh, on June 11th, I made the point is there's a lot of literature, scientific literature, but a lot of it isn't practical. Uh, the means of dealing with Japanese beetle really hasn't changed for probably the last 30 to 40, maybe beyond that. Um, the, non, the non-insecticidal the non means, of course, are hand-picking, which can be effective if you do early on and you have small infestations, removing certain weeds, uh, Joe Pye weed and Southerners that there are so attractive. Um, we do not recommend using the Japanese beetle traps. Um, the studies are out there indicating they'll lure more Japanese beetles into an area. The Japanese beetle goats might feed on plants before getting into the trap, and the females may lay eggs and turf grass that's being irrigated around that area. So uh, it's, 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 very, it's very limited. Uh, the primary means is spraying insecticides. One of the downsides is many of these insecticides are we consider broad spectrum. They kill everything, and, and consequently, you can have these ec- ecological backlashes uh, and when you spray too much. Uh, one of them is you can stimulate spider mite outbreaks um, and you can cause other insects or mites to become pests when you're using things like Carbriller 7 or some of the pyrethroids that are labeled for use against Japanese beetle adults. And, you know, many of us are trying to, to do an integrated pest management for most of those things. And so you can wipe out all your good work pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the hand the hand picking is, is you know, it works early on, but if you've got a thousand roses, it might not be practical. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to get, the, the, the key is you, you've got to hand pick before the, the beetles cause extensive damage. And consequently, the roses will release these volatile compounds that will attract Japanese beetle adults. And then those Japanese beetle adults that are on the plants uh, produce these aggregation pheromones. And what those are is they lure more Japanese beetles. So the plant basically is uh, is being inundated by these beetles because of the volatile compound produced by the plant and the pheromones released uh, by the beetle the beetle adults themselves. So it's really it's sort of a catch twenty two. So we we start getting them in June, um, usually mid June, and I've seen them as late as you know the end of September. Uh, only a few by that time, but they just come by the thousands. But um, when we when you spoke before and I got to hear you, you mentioned stopping them early. There is some merit in that. Yeah. I mean, basically uh, like anything, the earlier, the more you do in the front end, the less you're going to have to do in the back end. One of my favorite statements. Um, But, you know, again, if you're in an area where you've got a lot of these hosts, whether they be linden trees or other roses or other plants, it makes it very difficult because, the the Japanese beetles have sort of a quote buffet uh, to select from, but, but handpicking, you know, has to be very diligent and some studies are shown almost every day, uh, three times per day. And I don't really think people have that much time uh, to do that. Uh, It's, it's, it's unfortunate. We don't have any roses that are bred for uh, Japanese beetle tolerance and mainly because most of the breeding programs are revolve around flower color, flower uh, scent, and, and other horticulture characteristics. But So that's why I was alluding to is we really haven't made, in my mind's eye, much progress in dealing with Japanese beetles within the last, you know, I think 30 to 40 years, maybe beyond that. I mean, it still relies on these broad spectrum insecticides that, again, uh, from an ecological standpoint, uh, can, can, can create substantial um, backlashes. The big one is secondary pest outbreak. And what that means is if you continue to spray and kill the Japanese beetle, you release the pest, like two-spotted spider mite, from its natural regulatory or managed practices, and they, and they can basically uh, become a major problem. So you're sort of on this pesticide treadmill uh, having to spray uh, because of the scenario. I've I've known several people who um, their mode of dealing with this is to when they come they cut off all the blooms of their roses, so um, 
I think that I, I think I've seen that be somewhat effective because I think it must be the blooms in the scent that are the most attractive. But you know that doesn't help with if they're coming for your Joe Pye weed or your London tree or your or your pole beans for that matter. But but um, is you know would you say that you know getting rid of the blooms for a period of time would be helpful? Well, on one hand, I mean, why grow roses if you're not going to get them to bloom? <laughs> That's, I mean, you're, you're growing roses to get nice blooms. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to really accept that as some type of magic strategy unless you uh, cut them back enough. But I mean, you, you, you want roses to bloom. So really, I, I struggle to even think of that as some type of strategy. And I have not seen any data to show that it actually might work. I mean, you're, I mean, even if, if they feed on the leaves, uh, there's going to be some host plant volatiles given off or emitted that may still attract them. So mm-hmm. I, I really, I don't have much credence for that without some type of quantitative data trace. It is so it works. But again, why remove flowers or rose if you're, you know, why put roses in your garden then if you're going to keep removing the flowers? <laughs> oh boy. That just, that just kind of brings it all back home. Doesn't it? Yeah. Um, we do want roses and we, we do want our roses to bloom. Um, so we know the things that don't work now. So what would you recommend that we do? What are some things that we can do to, other than hand picking to minimize the damage that they do and the numbers of them? Well, it's very minimal, Tracy. Like I mentioned in the presentation, it boils down to uh, getting out there early. When you see your first one, hand picking, hand picking, spraying, spraying early. Uh, and, and and try to try to reduce the numbers that might be getting on your, um, roses. The other one you could give your neighbors Japanese beetle traps as Christmas presents. That's also <laughs> something that might be maybe maybe not ethical, but might help somewhat. Uh, uh, the other one is if you wanted to is, is grow synthetic roses, uh, plastic <laughs> roses. I don't think they're you know attractive. Uh, but th- there is one aspect that I wanted to, to present there is that some people talk about trap cropping. And what that is, let me explain to your audience, is putting in plants that are very highly, highly attractive. Now, you know, what does that mean? But I do know cannas are very attractive to Japanese beetles. And maybe putting cannas in an area away from the roses uh, might lure them away. That's, that's, I don't think anybody has done any uh, quantitative, robust scientific studies. But it, it's, you know, when you're dealing with Japanese beetles, you know, you have to look outside the triangle and see what's, 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 what's a problem out there. Um, so there are some, there are some uh, potential, but it's, again, it's very limited. I mean, if you, if you, especially if you're showing roses, you know, you really can't, your tolerance for Japanese beetles is, it's almost zero. Mm-hmm. That's very true. That's very true. Now, I do have people who tell me that they have eliminated Japanese beetles. I mean, seriously, that they've eliminated Japanese beetles by putting, by treating the grubs, putting something on the turf. Well, elimination is a very strong term, but you can alleviate problems of Japanese beetles by applying a, a insecticide, timing it accordingly when the uh, larvae are emerging from the eggs or grubs. And if you get very high mortality, um, fewer larvae will overwinter. The problem is that Japanese beetles can fly four or five miles. So, I mean, everybody in the neighborhood would have to, to do that if you want that to be effective. So, um Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the other one is just don't irrigate your turf grass uh, because the Japanese beetle females have to have a moist um, uh, soil moisture for them to lay eggs, which will enhance the survivability of those eggs uh, overall. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's mm-hmm. one option, but it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to get them. And of course, every insect mite population fluctuates like all living organisms. So you might think you've removed mm-hmm. them and all of a sudden the next year you've got a You've got a pan. You've got a pandemic of Japanese beetles feeding on your your roses. We actually did have a couple of years where they were very, very few, mm-hmm. but that was on the tail end of a very extreme drought. So, yeah. perhaps you know that interrupted their life cycle. That's what we thought, anyway. Well, it does. Insects and mites rely on temperature and moisture. If you get um, wet springs in summer, that enhances survivability of the uh, larva grubs in the soil. Consequently, you, you can get more emergence of the adults. Um, if it's dry, that will lead to possibly the larva tunneling deeper in the soil profile, maybe some higher mortality. Um, and that may also lead to reduction in 
in the number of uh, number of adults. So it, it could be, it's probably, you know, in, in the insect world, it's moisture and temperature and the ambient temperature and in the, in the, for the grub stage, it's the soil temperature. So, you know, again, uh, you know, we, we've had lots of rain and of course that just right now, the Japanese beetles are coming out that just, that enhances survivability of, of the larva, the grubs, and consequently could result in higher numbers of adults emerging. Oh, we've had so much rain. They sh- they're they probably just so happy. Now, I guess there's no hope that, like the locusts, they're going to go away someday. The, the locusts? Didn't, d- don't we have locusts, like, periodically? There's nothing like that that's going to happen with the... Oh, no, periodical cicada, yeah. 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 So- uh, they're not going to go away either. They just are in the soil for 13 or 17 years, depending on the species. And they come out and, and they just basically, they make good news items. Uh, it's a, a fantastic phenomenon. But uh, the Japanese beetles has been here since 19, 1916. It has crossed over the Mississippi River into most of those states from North Dakota down to Texas. Um, so it's here to stay. Yeah. We're, yeah. yeah. So you think it's going to keep going west too? You know, um um, is that just being carried on plant material or or um, it's just inching across state lines? Well, most uh, most of the western states have what we call the Japanese harmonization program. And if some uh, uh, nursery in Minnesota wants to ship to California, they have to go. We call it the Japanese harmonization program. And in a nutshell, that is the grower has to treat their either nursery stock uh, boulder, burlap, or container with certain insecticides, and the states may vary in what they want before they ship. And of course, mm-hmm. they, they can be inspected. The, the same, the same for sod. So the, these these western states, probably Wyoming, uh, Utah, West, um, they have these harmonization programs to prevent the Japanese beetle from getting there. There have been cases of Japanese beetles were in uh, California, but they uh, they were able to uh, eradicate it or just uh, reduce the population's point where they're not an issue. But that's why, um, you know, a grower in Indiana, Indiana wanting to ship to Washington has to comply with the Japanese harmonization mm-hmm. program before they can ship it to that state. They've seen the trouble we're in with these beetles, so they do not want them. No, no. Yeah. Well, can we just turn and talk about another rose pest that I deal with? Yeah. Rose midge. Tell okay. us about yeah. rose midge. Well, r- rose midge is a, a diptera. It's a fly. It's in the family Uh It looks like a mosquito. Now, the, the, the females, the adults don't feed, but the females lay eggs on rose buds or stems. And the larva, uh, it's a fly, has these sickle-shaped mandibles, and they basically serrate buds and stems causing them to be distorted or, or curl under. And eventually they fall to the uh, soil to pupate. Uh, and, and, then they, and then they come out again. The, the way to deal with rose midge is to get out there early and cut out um, sections that do uh, exhibit damage. Um, but the other one is uh, putting like an insecticide in the soil. And the old, the old one used to be diazinon, but now that's gone. So they're using the metacloprid to kill the larva uh, before they pupate, or you can put a uh, weed fabric barrier to block them and you can vacuum them or sweep them up at that point to alleviate the problem. But yeah, uh, it is a major problem. You, you can spray, but timing is critical. So once the damage is evident, uh, it's pretty much too late to do anything at that point, Teresa. So um, I hadn't heard about the fabric, but I can see where that would work to have yeah. some, at least yeah. around the base of your rose. Maybe right. for temporary or something. Well, it'll block them from entering the soil, and they need soil to, to pupate and they come out as adults. And then you can vacuum or collect that and collect the pupa and, and throw them away or dispose of them as far as possible. And that could help alleviate uh, some issues with, with rose midge. Yeah. Well, let's go to one more before I let you go. And that so many people talk about the rose slugs and the damage that they do. Well, rose slugs are not really slugs. They're actually called soft flies. They're um, in the the same order. Uh, they're in a Hymenoptera, which is the order of ants and bees. And uh, the females are a winged individual. They don't feed, but they lay eggs. And the larvae emerge. They look like slugs. 
Uh, they're very milky, smooth, and they primarily feed on the underside of leaves. There are several species, bristly, curled. Um, they're, they're listed in the uh, second edition of the Rose Compendium. And, you know, they can cause substantial damage. And so one, one way of dealing with them is either hand picking or using a uh, high pressure water spray to dislodge them. Uh, they won't come back, you know, or using one of the typical contact insecticides to kill them. But yeah, they can cause substantial damage. Uh, it would take a lot of them to set a rose back, but obviously it doesn't, the, the, the rose doesn't look aesthetically pleasing when you've got uh, the leaves kind of defoliated or holes in them. Uh, and they come so early, it seems anymore. They they come so early. Yeah, we we've we've had them this year. Uh, this is June, uh, probably related to temperature and moisture. Mm -hmm. Moisture, lots of moisture, <laughs> lots lots of moisture in the last few weeks, and now the whole country seems to have a lot of heat. Yeah, meteor, meteorology is an unfinite science. <laughs> yes, it is. So with all of the heat, what what what's our next big pest going to be? Well, I don't know. When, when you have heat, uh, the heat units, that is the cumulative heat units of degree days, tend to occur faster. So that'll speed up the life cycle and development of insects and mites as you get these very high temperatures to a point. There is a temperature where, you know, they're just going to shut down because uh, it's too hot even for them. So it's just going to, for example, the two-spotted spider mite, uh, which is a pest, a major pest of roses, uh, when the temperature get above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the life cycle from egg to adult can occur in seven to 10 days. And that's why you see populations can explode in a very short period of time during the heat of summer when you're getting these, these hot, these hot uh, dry conditions. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's gonna be different. I know something that we don't deal with here, but another pest that, that so many of our friends out West deal with it and uh, in South even is the chili thrips. Yeah, that's in the Florida, the Southeast. The chili thrips uh, feeds on the foliage. It doesn't really feed on the flowers. It can cause substantial damage. Um, but it's like Western flower thrips and all the other thrips. It, it will cause uh, uh, stippling or, uh, you know, distortion of, of the leaves. Uh, it doesn't get in the flowers like Western flower thrips does. But still, it's something, you, you know, you, you have to deal with to alleviate the damage caused by the chili thrips. So there, that's a relatively new problem that we have, right? It, it's one of our most recent uh, pests is, is the chili thrips, yeah. So, um, yeah, so hopefully that one will stay away. Maybe, maybe that one doesn't like our cold temperatures? Well, insects adapt. Uh, I wouldn't say that's going to be true. Um, I mean, give it time. Uh, we'll just <laughs> see if it moves up. But uh, insects don't read the books. <laughs> they're not they they do what they want so you know we we've had insects that people thought weren't going to be here uh and it has nothing to do with climate change or global warming it's just the movement of plant material suburbanization uh people moving in from other areas so <coughs> excuse me the, the the possibility of it being introduced in an area uh, because there is no isolation and there's a lot of state-to-state -state movement uh, is is a strong potential Mm -hmm. So we're not the only ones. It's not just the people who love the roses. No, I mean, it feeds in other plants besides roses. So, yeah, it's it's, it's very prolific, it's meaning it feeds on, a, just like Japanese beetle, it feeds on a wide diversity of plant material. Yeah, They just drive us crazy because we love roses, and that's what we like to grow. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you can't have your cake and eat it too, Teresa. I guess not. I guess not. I just I just want to, you know, these things to just uh, have their day and move on. But I guess they're not moving on, at least not quickly. No, no, they're, they're here to stay. If you know, we've only eradicated one organism um, from the planet, and that was smallpox, which is still questionable. But uh, <laughs> they're here to stay, yeah. And their, their movement will vary uh, depending on moisture and temperatures, through, through the various regions, of course, host plant material will also be a key factor in ex uh, exasperating their potential movement. Well, Dr. Cloyd, thanks so much for joining me today. The news isn't exactly what we want to hear, but our eyes are open wider. And, you know, it is a beautiful little bug, but it's just so destructive. Yeah, I mean, if somebody could figure out a means of, a, you know, uh, where humans could eat it as a delicacy, uh, you know, like birds, some birds will eat them like guineas and I think chickens will. They just don't eat enough of them. 
you know, maybe maybe there's an opportunity to explore uh, Japanese beetle shish kebabs or casserole or something. <laughs> and let's find a new market for this bug. Yeah. Oh, this is just not going to work. This is not going to sell. <laughs> okay. Well, you got to think outside the triangle. <laughs> Yeah, that's way outside the lines. So thanks so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining me. You're welcome, Trace. Anytime. Hope you have a good day. And I hope your listeners uh, enjoy uh, the information. Yes. yes. Well, friends, thanks for joining us today. And may the pests in your gardens be few. And until next time, happy gardening. You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.